Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our pre-concert talk. My name is Gary Levinson. I am the Ch Chamber of Music Society's of Fort Worth Artistic Director. And with a bittersweet welcome, I have to tell you this is the last pre-concert talk of this season. Um, but we'll tell you all about next season in a moment. Uh, and it may look like some of our musicians have left already, but that's not true. <laughs> so to explain all of this, please help me welcome Laurie Shulman, our dear friend. Thank you, Gary, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be here, but mostly I'm happy to see most of your faces. Isn't this wonderful after the long slog of semi-anonymity? So here's to a healthy, happy afternoon full of wonderful music. This is an extraordinary program that Gary has pulled together for today. It is unusual for us to have all strings when it's not a string quartet. Yes, and usually when we have a string quartet, it's a string quartet that makes a living playing string quartets, as we all know. We don't like to put ad hoc string quartets together, but because this is such an unusual combination, I'm very proud of this program. And every one of the pieces that you're going to hear has its own special story. We start with our old friend Ludwig van Beethoven, who is no stranger to this auditorium, but I believe this is the first time we've ever heard the so-called eyeglasses duo. Yes, indeed. And it's one of the things that, that you know that when I program, one of the things we try to do is we try to sort of have an arc that connects all of these pieces. And the eyeglasses, as well as, well, essentially every piece on this program, except for the Arensky, was written by someone who did not make their living as a professional composer. So in some ways, it's really dear to my heart because the so-called amateur in many ways loves the music and li loves writing music in a very different way than a professional composer who gets paid to do it. But I would also draw your attention to the fact that the word amateur comes from the Latin and Italian verb to love. And it comes from loving the art form and the joy of music making. Amateurs in Mozart's and Beethoven's day weren't necessarily amateur players by our standards. They could be highly accomplished players who simply did not earn their living as a professional musician. But it was considered an essential part of one's education to play at least one musical instrument in the upper middle classes and certainly in the aristocracy. And in the eyeglasses, it's a very interesting combination, isn't it? So you have the viola, which was not really a solo instrument, though it was a favorite of Mozart. And then you have the cello, which really has not taken its step forward. It would take that step forward maybe in 50 years, though we had Boccherini, who of course was a master cellist and, and, and wrote some incredible concertos. But this combination of, of viola and cello I would actually say that as a string player, it's maybe more virtuosic for the cello. It's way, way high in, in position, and uh, it takes a lot of work to get this thing done. Well, we're getting one step ahead of ourselves. If you take a look at your program, you'll see that we're opening with this Beethoven, which is obviously a duo, and Gary just tipped his hand since our musicians are still invisible. Yeah, it is on. It is. Yeah, you, you just got to hold it closer, I think. Okay. Is that better, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah, thank you. Okay. I will try to use my professorial voice. Yeah, scream like me. Yes. <laughs> so the first piece is a duet for viola and cello, as Gary said. The second piece is a trio, but not for the conventional uh, combination of violin, viola, and cello. Instead, it's for two violins and cello, and therein lies a story that I will tell you in a bit. The piazzola is arranged for string trio, originally for piazzola's own uh, tango band, and the Arensky is a quartet for strings, but not the conventional two violins, viola, and cello. Instead, it is for... It is for two cellos, viola, and violin. So th I think one of the things that he really enjoyed about the sonority, and you'll hear this from the very first note, the sonority in, in the Arensky, uh, you know, is very dark, almost Russian choir sonority. So the second cello is not in any way a compromised second anything part. It is actually a very important anchor to, to the sound that Aronsky wants. Let's rewind to the front end of the program. This piece was written for the gentleman whose image is on the screen right now. He was an Hungarian diplomat who was pretty good friends with Beethoven. If you've read the first paragraph of uh, the program notes this afternoon, you'll see that when Beethoven delivered the score to this duo to him, it was addressed to 
Baron Muckraker, I think, mm -hmm. or something like yep. that. So they clearly enjoyed a friendly and affectionate relationship, which was not always the case with Beethoven and his patrons. What do we know about Baron uh, Zmeskal von Domanovich? Well, what I know not too much, but what I do know that he really loved the sound of the strings, and he, of course, played like as everybody would play the keyboard. But he was very much in love uh, with Sound of the Strings, and I think that he probably would have been very surprised by this duo. So tell us a little bit about the subtitle that's been given to this. Well, so the, the subtitle is, of, it says, with two obligato eyeglasses. And I think it's probably a play on words because what does obligato means? It's like a secondary line, maybe an accompanying line. But, you know, the two eyeglasses, unlike a pince nez, for example, it goes around your nose. And so um, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but I'll say that there is a tradition for this performance of this piece where people have all kinds of props and they take glasses on and off and they come in with, we're not doing that. It's all about the music. So let's hear a little bit of the music, and it will be pretty apparent to you, the two voices, who's leading, who's following, and when they switch roles. Example one, please, Clancy. Could you hear after the first statement of the theme how all of a sudden the cello jumped up an octave to a higher register and the viola took over that accompaniment role? Exactly, and this is what I was referring to before. Uh, you have to take into consideration in Beethoven's time to play up in position would have been very difficult. And it certainly would have been very difficult for the amateur, but obviously the Baron enjoyed this and Beethoven kept it. So in my second example, I have... Uh, it's more shared material, and the exchanges of material are moving a lot more rapidly. You're going to hear something that's more like truer duet writing rather than just melody and accompaniment. And also, I'd like you to notice how close the two ranges are. If it were on the piano, everything would be sort of clustered around middle C. Example two, please. So, Gary, this is supposed to be a duet for amateurs, was it? Um, yes, actually. I, th I think, again, you know, we can talk about limitations of the amateur, but I think Beethoven, instead of looking at the limitation, pushed that envelope and actually got, gave the amateur the ability, and it's kind of a vision where you're going with it, so that whether it's technical or musical or both, you would be, as an amateur, able to achieve that and able to achieve the musical goal as well. It is a compliment to his dedicatee that he felt that his dedicatee and the other player were capable of playing this music. Now, the second piece on the program was also almost certainly written for amateurs. It's by a Russian composer named Alexander Borodin, who was not a composer by profession. He took his higher education in chemistry mm -hmm and taught at one of the universities in the natural sciences area. Uh, he achieved his renown primarily for the Polovitsian dances and other excerpts from Prince Igor. We don't have much chamber music by Borodin. However, his one string quartet is much beloved in the chamber literature because of its slow movement nocturne, which has been transcribed for string orchestra and yeah. lots of And also of used others. in all kinds of films, you know, Kismet, mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff. Right, yeah. right. So this particular work that we're going to hear by Alexander Borodin is a trio for two violins and cello. Ah, I can tell who's paying attention to the visuals up here. Respectable people do not write music or make love as a career. Attributed to Alexander Borodin. I'm sure it's true. He was a man of opinions, if nothing else. So this trio, I have to tell you the backstory on this. The promotion, this is like kitchen sink ingredients information, What? how the sausage is made. I'm working on the program notes about a month ago, and on the website it says Borodin String Trio in G minor. 
which I located, and it's a set of variations on a Russian song. And neither of us noticed it until we were putting the movements on the page, and Gary said, one of the movements is missing. And I said, what do you mean? It's a one-movement set of variations. And he said, no, it's a different trio. So I do some more digging, and I discover that Bordine wrote four string trios. Every last one of them is for two violins and cello, and every last one of them is in G. <laughs> and, and what made it worse is that they're all incomplete. Yes. Well, so you, you the think variations you, on the folk song, I think, is a self-standing movement. Okay, but most of them are incomplete, so I have yeah. a feeling that he had ADD, so we're excused from uh, yeah. figuring out what the movements are. <laughs> At any rate, this, uh, they all date from very early in his career, before he got interested in opera. Oh, we have to get a couple of more bon mots for him first. A composer among chemists, and here's another proverb from him. I am a composer in search of oblivion, and I'm always slightly ashamed to admit that I compose. <laughs> I do not want this to prejudice you against the music, which is really quite charming. It's just that it really sounds as if it could have been written in the first 10 years of the 19th century yeah. rather than 50 years and later. And also, doesn't it, while it has some Russian character, a lot of it sounds very French and it sounds very noble. So I think you'll really enjoy it. And in, in, in some ways, if you remember the Glinka trio that we did earlier, uh, the piano trio, it's that sort of flavor. And it, it, it's also much well, what is it, 50, 60 years away from the Rachmaninoff and then the thick stuff that we had earlier this year, too. Yes, musical language changed a lot in the 19th century, and that might be the most understated observation I make this afternoon. At any rate, let's listen to the beginning of this Bordin G major trio, first movement. Example three, please. That example essentially constitutes a sort of fanfare introduction, which starts out with all three instruments in unison, and its signature gesture is the bum, 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 which we call a Mannheim rocket. It is a rapidly ascending arpeggio that was a popular gesture in a lot of late 18th century music, and it figures quite prominently in the first movement of the Borodin. Now we hear the first theme, which surprisingly doesn't go to either of the violins, it goes to the cello. And if you listen carefully, you'll hear that Mannheim rocket in there again. May we have the next track, please? And then we are off and running. He takes us to a very proper sonata form second theme, contrasting in character. Now we're going to hear it in D major, which is where you'd expect to go for a second theme for a trio in G major. But now uh, the melodic interest is going to be in the violins, but the activity and the rhythm in the cello remain a little bit more interesting. Let us hear track five, please. It's quite lovely, very pleasing, probably a pleasure to play for all the players, but not particularly difficult. Does not present the challenges that the Beethoven well, does. It, it, yeah, it, it's, it's the contrast to the Beethoven from a technical standpoint of view, but I do think that it does present some so, so, sonorities that are very different for us. So it, it, it's a question for us when we were rehearsing, actually, this came up. Um, you, you want to kind of play the instrument in a way that the music is written, but he actually doesn't let you do that. He makes you play. Well, in a simpler manner, but what we found as we worked through this in the week is it's actually much more charming that way. In other words, if you make something you know, sound more romantic or more virtuoso, and the character of the music isn't there, it's, it doesn't serve the music or the musicians. It's also very well crafted in an academic sort of way. You will hear that in this next example. We're still in the first movement. This is from the development section, and you'll hear how he starts to toss around that Mannheim rocket mov motive. Track six, please. Mm -hmm. 
imitate a counterpoint. So you hear he is really developing that. He's giving all three players a chance at it. And it doesn't become monotonous. He knows when to lay off and introduce something else to move to the next segment. There, there's one thing I'd love for you to listen for, and this is an excellent example of this. The, the key centers are, of course, very tonal, but he throws in some, quote, wrong notes. And we kept ch checking it. Was it wrong? Was it wrong? No, it's... Yeah, it's on purpose, like Mussorgsky did it. I think this is the real Russian tradition of early 19th century where, yes, it's tonal, but for whatever reason, they would throw in some notes just to keep you on, your, on the edge of your seat. I'm sure the amateurs learning this had exactly the same questions as we did for this. Well, we're going to move on now for one clip from the second movement, which is an andante, essentially in ternary form. The example I've chosen is from the minor mode middle section, which is a little bit more agitated, and shows him, I think, writing in a more imaginative way for the string trio. May we hear track seven, please? You could hear one of the violins just going at the one, two, three, one, two, three, those steady triplets in the middle. Normally, that is a role that would have been given to the viola. Absolutely. But and there's no viola in this trio. What did Borodin have against violas? Uh, <laughs> probably like violinists better, and so do I. <laughs> no, uh, but the thing is that, that he quotes the ghost trio, the slow, the slow movement of the ghost trio with the embellishments. Very interesting. Good, good observation, and there is another Beethoven connection uh, in the second, or excuse me, the last work on the program. Before we leave Borodin, I think we need to tip our hand to the audience because they did not see a second violinist credited on the program page. Yes, so our violist, who you're very well familiar with, Michael Klotz, actually is one of the few people who got a graduate degree both in violin and viola playing, and for many years now, I've, I thought our audiences deserved to hear his violin playing. And now you will. So we've, we've tapped him for um, the, the second violin part in this Borodin trio. Okay, now moving on to the next work on the program is a fast forward into the 20th century, uh, a geographical shift to South America and Argentina, the so-called king of tango, Astor Piazzolla. This plunges us headlong into the flavors of ethnic souls. Absolutely, and I, I, love, I love this. There's a great quote. I don't know, if, I don't, it's not here, but... Um, he studied with a famed uh, composer and teacher, Nadia Boulanger. And this is someone who taught Leonard Bernstein and, and Aaron Copeland. And so apparently he comes to her after studying with her for a few months and saying, eh, I just need some help. I don't feel like this is really working out. All of the, you know, she's studying in the scores. Is this okay? But something is missing. And, and she said, why don't you bring me some of your own original music, some of your tango music? And he did, and she said, this is Piazzolla. This is working hard. <laughs> so the, 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 he's most known for first tangos now. Yeah. And I love the fact that one of the Borodin quotations used the word oblivion, and oblivion is the title of this Piazzolla piece. It was a very nice segue for us. At any rate, Oblivion is one of Piazzolla's best-known works. He actually wrote the words to the song. It exists in multiple versions as almost everything that Pia Piazzolla wrote. I would say does. every instrument has some kind of version of this. Yes, and uh, the version that Gary has programmed, of course, is a string trio version, this time for the conventional makeup of a string trio. Uh, you will have to listen carefully in the introduction to hear the tango rhythm, because this is a slow tango, but you'll hear how he embellishes it and varies it in my second example. Let's hear track eight, please, which sets up the introduction with the underlying uh, bass, rhythm, and harmony.
He starts out with the sultry, melancholic, warm, creamy tone of the viola for the initial statement of the melody. The cello is obviously playing pizzicato to deliver the bass, and the first violin is sort of meandering, weaving its own counter melody up top. Actually, both of the upper voices do that. It, the, the first violin actually accompanies in the beginning, but the most important thing is that the tempo of this tango. This is a very sensuous tango, and I think in some ways the only wrong way to do it is to play it too fast because right. it goes by so fast. Right. So it's a very sensuous, hypnotic, I would say, piece of music that you just kind of want to close your eyes and take it all in. You will recognize the music in the second example, but you'll hear how he's varied it. The cello is still playing pizzicato, but it's a lot more emotionally intense, and the way the two upper instruments, the viola and the violin, intertwine with one another is significantly more complex while still maintaining that relaxed pace. Let's hear track nine, please. Gary, how would you describe the interaction between the violin and the viola in that example? I would say basically dovetails. They, they pick up each other's lines, but as I said, the, the beauty of it is you have the violin in a very high register, and you have the viola in a very low register, and so together they meet somewhere in the middle. For those of you who do not know much about Piazzolla, his instrument was the bandoneon, which is a variety of button accordion, and he played mostly with chamber ensembles like the one in this image. Uh, there were varying instrumental components of his ensembles over the years, but it was considered a great privilege to work with him, and he interacted with some of Argentina's other great, great tango composers. So it's just a little smidgen we get this afternoon, but it will definitely be a palate cleanser between the Borodine and the Arensky, because we are now going back to Russia. When I obtained the score to this piece, I knew ahead of time that it had two cellos rather than the conventional two violins. What, and I also knew that it quoted uh, its central movement, which is a big set of variations on a piano piece by Tchaikovsky. And it was done as sort of a tribute, uh, much like the Tchaikovsky trio. The piano trio, yeah. Exactly. Yes, absolutely. Uh, but the um, I learned that the finale, actually all four movements use a pre-existing melody. Two of them come from Russian Orthodox chant. One of them is a Russian folk song, and one is the melody by Tchaikovsky. Indeed, and also there's quite a few quotes of the Mighty Five. We don't have time to get into the Mighty Five, but a lot of the amateur composers and, and the professional composers that they enjoyed um, would write melodies that they would borrow from each other. So this is a real tribute by Borin and so Arensky. So we're going to start, I have, Arensky did write this piece in memoriam for Tchaikovsky, who died in 1893. Uh, Russian chant establishes the lugubrious mood. It's just classic dark Russian <laughs> stuff. And also he's emphasizing the fact that he has these rich three lower voices, the viola and two celli, rather than the more conventional emphasis you'd expect in melodies with two violins. Let's hear the first example in the Arensky track 10, please.
Gregorian chant is not the same thing as Russian Orthodox chant, but they are analogous. And you could sort of imagine that opening chant with a chorus of monks doing their devotions at a service in the Russian it's, Orthodox. This is the right. very beginning of the, the quartet. I just want to point out that it, it sets the mood much more than about the notes or about the phrasing. It's just, it, it's foreshadowing, and you're going to hear that for all of the piece. But Arensky shows us in the middle of this first movement that he really knows how to whip up a storm. Our next example, it's excited, it's agitated, and he's raring to go. He's kind of chomping at the bit here. The next track here, please. There are parts of that buildup that, to me, sound like they're 40 years ahead of the golden age of Hollywood movie music. For sure. And you'll, you have to open your eyes to figure out it's actually only four players. Yes. It's very orchestral, and it's very powerful. Indeed. It's like a huge wave of sound. Indeed. All right. The central movement pays homage to Tchaikovsky by using this theme from one of his piano pieces. Let's hear that theme, please. Uh, it's track 12. It starts with in the violin with pizzicato accompaniment and then full harmony for all all four players. Notice how when he goes to the full harmony, he harmonizes it the way the chant might have been harmonized from the Russian Orthodox rite. But boy, does he go to town on these variations. I very arbitrarily chose excerpts from four of them. Here's variation two, which has skittering violin and viola. And the cello is playing pizzicato with one cello, and the second cello has the melody. The next track, please. Gary, what's going on on the violin and viola? It's very Mendelssohnian, actually. It's, it's very quick, and, and yet it's not virtuosic. It's something, again, that came up in rehearsals. We, I think the great thing about this variation is the contrast. So you have the beautiful melody in the second cello, and then you have the articulation of the first cello, and then the other instruments are just filling it out with a Mendelssohnian scare. So it's charming, charming variation. The variation four is marked vivace, which means lively. Here we have the theme in the first cello, but uh, it is shared with the other cello. And the upper voices are now pizzicato. May we hear track 14, please? <laughs> I'm reminded a little bit of the scherzo to Tchaikovsky's Fourth Symphony Indeed. in there. Well, this is actually very interesting because we can't tell as a listener whether it's humorous or whether it's actually chasing someone. It's, it's supposed to be right in the middle. And that, hopefully that's the way it comes off. Well, I guess we'll be able to tell by the expressions on all of your faces when uh, you're playing yeah. it, right? Exactly. Okay. Uh, jumping to variation six. This one has virtuosic sweeping upward arpeggios, and we've got a kind of perpetual motion going in the other instruments in rhythmic unison. <laughs> Right here we can hear Tchaikovsky's original melody more clearly. 
So this is very definitely virtuosic it's writing. It's definitely virtuosic, and it's ex very interesting writing also because Arensky was a pianist, and we'll spare you some of the funniest quotes, but the, the, suffice it to say, most of these variations are written for people with five fingers, and we can only use four <laughs> because the thumb does not work for us. All right, my next example is from Variation 7, which switches to C major and inverts the melody. It turns it upside down. But by now, you've heard that melody enough times so that you're going to recognize its contour. And the accompaniment is sort of sighing emotional figures. Next track, please. Very gentle, emotional, laid back. Also, a, a, a shameless um, quote from the Tchaikovsky Piano Tree, Six Variation. <laughs> so it's, it, but I think in his time, that would have been a compliment. Yes, it was intended as tribute. It wasn't intended as plagiarism. All right, my last example is from the finale, which opens with another somber quotation from the Re Russian Orthodox Requiem Mass. But that's not what I'm going to play for you, because Arensky gives fugal treatment to a theme that anyone who knows the Beethoven Razumovsky quartets is very likely to recognize. Track 17, please. <laughs> So he knows his counterpoint, and he wants to make sure that you're going to recognize that tune. Yeah, I think part of it we have, we have to mention before we close is that he did not get the time of day from some of his teachers. And I, I guarantee you that this is a very hard fugue to write, and he wanted to say, hey, I can do a good job with this too. And um, he, con he finishes the movement very convincingly. Uh, and it's, it's really marvelous writing. It is a huge audience pleaser. And string players regard this quartet with respect because it is not easy to play at all. But I know that we are going to hear a wonderful performance this afternoon. And I so appreciate all of you coming a little bit early to allow us to introduce to you these flavors of ethnic souls. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.